thank you everyone for joining us. And again, this um, is a Cardi Nerds wide um, session, but uh, you know, it's here as part of the curriculum for the HIT trialists for the Clinical Trials Network. Uh, and this is such an important discussion. We're going to be talking about women and cardiovascular research with three extraordinary and inspiring people who we all have looked up to for quite some time now. And to lead this discussion, really ex excited and happy to uh, bring back to the stage Dr. Leanne Arsinas, who is uh, for, I guess, three more days at PGY6, cardiology fellow and current chief fellow, or I guess, there we say resident, <laughs> different lingo. This is cross country. Uh, at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, she will be soon starting her fellowship in EP this July at the University of Calgary. Leanne was born in the Philippines and moved to Canada when she was 16 years old and has since developed a passion in promoting women and underrepresented groups in pursuing a career in medicine. She is a Cardiner's uh, fellow and training trialist under the mentorship of Dr. Shelley Zirov. She's also a Cardiner's medical journalism correspondent and recently did a news article with Dr. Kamala Tamarisa on women and underrepresented ethnic groups in, a in EP. She, uh, beyond all this, just for everything that we've worked on on several projects now, has just brought so much excitement and positive energy and incredible quality. So just really excited to dive into it. Leanne, the floor is yours. Oh gosh, thanks so much for the introduction, Amit. And, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak with this amazing um, panel of speakers tonight. And I'm just so happy to share the stage with you and to have um, everyone smiling faces and in my computer. Um, so thanks everyone for being here tonight where we will talk about women in cardiovascular research. Uh, I'm so honored to have a chance to speak with Dr. Anu Lala, Dr. Alana Morris and Dr. Shelly Zira tonight. Um, before I do go ahead and ask them to introduce themselves, we would just like to let um, everyone know that this session is meant to be an open discussion for everyone, uh, with everyone having the opportunity to ask our speakers throughout the night. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them on the chat. I will look at it throughout the night uh, if you would prefer me to ask your questions. But if you would prefer to ask your questions yourself too, please just raise your hands or unmute yourself. And, ask your questions to our speakers as appropriate. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'm gonna start with the introductions for our speakers and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. I'll start with uh, Dr. Alana Moritz. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? So I'm Alana Moritz and I know many of you um, and hope to get to know the rest of you over the course of your careers. I am um, gosh, I guess I finished her player fellowship almost 10 years ago. I hate to date myself, but I'm still not that old. Um, and I actually, it's funny when I was a resident, I was a resident at the Brigham and, and really didn't think that I wanted to do research, um, but went to Emory A because I'm from Atlanta, but B because Emory had sort of a, a two plus two protected uh, clinical investigator track where you actually spent the first two years of fellowship doing research and then did your general cardiology training. And during those two years, because life really slowed down and I got to sort of um, just immerse myself in the literature and learn statistics and learn how to do analyses on my own, I really kind of fell in love with research. Knew I wanted to do heart failure and knew I wanted to do disparities work. And that was kind of what, what kicked it off for me. Um, so I joined the faculty at Emory after I finished heart failure. Job at Butler was one of my mentors, which I'm so grateful to still call him a friend and mentor. Um, as well as a, a guy named Arshay Kayumi, who does a lot of work in vascular dysfunction. Um, and so I would say the early part of my research, and tell me if I'm talking too much, um, was really focused on recruiting patient cohorts. I, um, I had a K23 initially, um, and then an RO3 where I recruited um, almost 260 patients with heart failure. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you guys know my work, my interest is in disparities, and we often sort of talk about the difficulty of recruiting patients from underrepresented race and ethnic groups that I, I did not have that experience. Um, there was a point where I was sort of like, we can't recruit any more black women because they're just, you know, skewing my numbers. Um, so I think, you know, we often sort of make excuses for the lack of certain patient groups and studies and trials. Um, this call makes me excited because I think one of the ways to overcome that, of course, is to have diversity um, in steering committees and investigators and the people who are interested in doing the work um, and making sure that we're recruiting the patient populations that we, that we know need to be represented. Um, and so now I'm doing clinical trials, which is interesting. It's a totally different beast, but it's also super fun. Um, and it's exciting to be able to participate in, 
and trials that will hopefully change uh, the way that we practice clinically. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. Lawrence. We'll go to Dr. Lala. Thanks so much, Sam. I really, um, you don't expect to have a big smile on your face at 815 at night after a full day of work. So um, I this is all genuine. <laughs> I can tell you that. So thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this, especially alongside two of my faves, Alana and Shelley. Um, I think my path uh, into research has been somewhat non-traditional. Um, but it's still filled with a lot of love and passion. I did residency at Mount Sinai, which is where I am currently as a heart failure, heart function cardiologist. Um, and then I was at NYU for cardiology fellowship. I fell in love there. It was kind of like, why am I doing anything else after this? I should just end up with a job now. I couldn't get it out of me that I loved the CCU. I loved hemodynamics. And NYU actually didn't have really a heart failure program at the time. And so it was really immersed in all of our um, rotations. And it was always what I gravitated to most. And so I was deciding at the time whether, and, and, you know, heart failure fellowship wasn't even an ACGME fellowship. So Alana, if I make you feel any better, I'm still almost 10 years out too. I think we're the same year, but to say that it wasn't an ACGME fellowship makes me sound a lot older, I think. Um, and so I went to the Brigham, uh, for heart failure and, and my husband was doing advanced endoscopy across the street at that time at the BI. And I think that's where really things blossomed for me. I, I used to call it kind of like medical Disneyland, where it was like all of a sudden you could ask questions and you could, you know, get answers to the questions and you had access to these immense leaders in the field who were eager to support and teach. And so I really, I caught the bug, so to speak, but a little bit later than I expected to. And so it was always my plan to go back to NYU as an attending because I was so well-placed and loved it there as a fellow. And I realized that it wasn't the right job for me after I had been at the Brigham, not because of it, but because of me and what I was looking for at the time. And so I ended up uh, switching um, and coming down or up the street to Mount Sinai, where I've been now for seven years. And um, my love for research, you know, aside from it um, at the Brigham and then even things that I used to do as a, as a fellow and trainee, I think it evolved from being a means to an end um, to, oh my God, I actually love this. And, and my love for it and clinical trials in particular came from coming together in collaborative groups to ask questions collectively and then think, thinking creatively about how we could answer those questions. And so I don't know if some of you guys know this, but maybe I'll just take a minute here. Rob and I actually met at HFSA as heart failure fellows. And we were, Lynn Stevenson wanted us to start this group called the Heart Failure Apprentice Network. And that was supposed to be this baby network of fellows, much like what you have here. Um, that And the parent network was the Heart Failure Network, which was NHLPI funded and supported. And Eugene Brunwald was the main PI there. And so we started our mini fellows network as a result. And Rob and I just happened to, you know, have a natural affinity for one another. And this just like sort of natural friendship blossomed from there. And then all of us have kept in touch since then. And obviously you know how closely I get to work with him uh, now. And then it moved, it, it, that kind of organically fed into uh, a lot of what I do now in clinical trial work. And I work in the cardiothoracic surgical trials network um, where the Sinai is the DCC, uh, which is also NHLBI funded. Thanks, Dr. Lala. It's, it's so interesting to see, you know, your personal journey through there and just like um, a mirror of what's happening to us right now. And I really hope that many of us follow that same pathway uh, from this group. Um, I'll move on now with uh, Dr. Zeroth. Wow, these are two hard acts to follow. Um, and I definitely am the oldest one here and the oldest out of practice for sure. Um, let's see, I finished my fellowship in 2006, people. Um, so that's a while ago. Um, and since then, um, I did my uh, advanced fellowship in Toronto General Hospital um, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Heather Ross, who is a very well-known heart failure and transplant physician here in Canada and the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I started off my research career there, of course, as a fellow, you have to do research projects, and I did several of them. Um, and some of them I liked, and some of them I didn't like, is 
the truth of it all. Um, and I did get exposed a little bit to clinical trials there, um, both industry uh, initiated ones, uh, so international um, industry funded clinical trials, as well as investigator initiated trials. And I loved it. I loved it. I don't have a fancy, um, you know, master's in anything. Um, I just sort of discovered research over time. Um, I Once I finished my fellowship, I came back to Winnipeg where I was recruited back to. Um, I was sort of born and raised Winnipeg area. I'm going to be a lifer here. Don't ask me to go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. It's family and friends here for sure. Um, and uh, so I came back here and I went back and forth to Toronto for a while um, to keep my skill set up with VADS until we started the program here locally. Um, and so that was a busy time. But I started exploring um, the opportunity to be a principal investigator in clinical trials here in Winnipeg. Uh, and so that sort of started me off. I would say I found many opportunities through my industry connections um, both professionally and in research as fellows and residents, you are told to stay away from them. But um, there's lots of opportunity, uh, professional opportunities uh, by engaging with industry in safe ways and, um, and then uh, research opportunities as well. Um, so I went from principal investigator to maybe going to some advisory boards, um, both nationally, eventually globally. I worked really hard in the middle of Canada to become the president of the Canadian Heart Failure Society. And that gave me some additional sort of opportunities and exposures as well. Um, and then I was being asked to be, through my past experience as principal investigator over a decade um, and enrolling well into clinical trials, I started being asked to be national lead for, for clinical trials um, and eventually steering committees um, and um, data safety monitoring boards. So there's, there's so much to explore in clinical trials, so many opportunities, so many different roles that you can play um, that I think it's been um, extremely rewarding for me. Uh, the, uh, the cardio nurse experience with uh, Paraglide has been a very unique experience. Um, and I have to thank John Ward for being so supportive and Amit and all of you um, for embracing this really unique initiative that um, has enhanced uh, and, and promoted diverse enrollment um, at this, literally a switch went off and things changed for us. Uh, and, you know, we hope that this is uh, something that will impact other clinical trial enrollments as well. Um, and just so I do have some exposure as a co-investigator on some CIHR grants. I just got a positive email today as well, um, but I haven't led anything. I have 25% protected research time. Don't fall for that. You either go 50 or higher for sure. 25% means that you are doing it in the evening hours, um, during your lunch time as well. So there's there's lots of tips and tricks we can talk about during as the night goes on. Alana was nodding her head there about the 25%. Don't both say 75% still means nights and weekends. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Right? <laughs> it all adds up to 200 and. 75% somehow. So don't expect for it to fit into a pie. Well, thanks so much for the introductions, Dr. Zira, Dr. Morris, and Dr. Lala. You kind of started touching on the Cardinal Clinical Trials Network. So I guess I'll start with the first question with that as well, actually. So as, as many of you know, the, the purpose of the Clinical Trials Network is uh, to pair equitable trial enrollment uh, with fit development. And so far, we are actually very proud as of May of 2022, uh, the fit trialists have remarkably enrolled a very diverse patient population with about 55% of them being women and about 82% being from racial underrepresented groups. Um, can you speak to us about the impact and benefits of diversity and representation in trial leadership and patient enrollments, both for benefits for us as trainees and also for our patients? Um, I think Dr. Morris kind of already started with that earlier, so I'll start on with, with her. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as I said earlier, it can be done, right? It just has to be a priority. And I think for this group, um, it's a priority for for whatever reason, either because the trial leadership has asked us to do it or because um, many of us in our hearts sort of believe that it's the right thing to do and it's the type of trial population we want to see. Um, you know, we, we're one thing that I hope in terms of sort of the work that we're doing now across the scientific space is this realization that if we're ever going to close the gap in terms of disparities, we have to do things differently. We have to make um, diversity and sort of really targeting certain patient populations a priority and not an afterthought. And I think that this program is really proving, um, number one, that we can do it. Number two, that it's probably not as difficult as, as we've, you know, sort of made it out to be in the past. Um, and number three, that perhaps with the changing of the guard, so to speak, right, with all of you young, um, excited <laughs> trainees who, you know, are interested in, again, sort of bringing this to fruition, um, that, that it's, it's, it's something that we can absolutely achieve. Yeah, I think bringing in um, more diversity and women as uh, local investigators, or even starting as part of a local co-investigator, um, that's a really, if you get that opportunity, get in there and um, mention it to your coordinators as well about, you know, let's, let's get some women, let's get some underrepresented groups here. Uh, it's really about being overt, like it's being, a, it's about being deliberate. You must be deliberate for this. Um, you know, a lot of the industry trials that I've been part of when I get to sort of see the operational components of it. They go to the same investigators over and over. So their, their, they, their fellowships were even before 2006. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and, and they keep getting reapproached and reapproached. And part of it is about breaking these habits at higher levels with um, global industry partners as well, but also the governmental, the, the uh, funders as well are recognizing the importance of diversity uh, and are are truly measuring it now as well, I think, in terms of um, diversity within the research team and clearly defined strategies in, in those um, platforms for recruitment of diverse populations as well. They really want to see it spelled out. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I think there's, it's no, you know, mystery or it's not, everyone knows the fact that women are underrepresented in the leadership of like high profile, multi-center cardiovascular clinical trials. If you look at the data, actually, it's one in 10 authors in high impact journals of clinical trials are women, which if you think about it, it's so ridiculous, you know, especially in the field of heart failure, which we're all in, um, it's, you know, there's the pioneers, many of the pioneers in heart failure have been women. So there's definitely room to improve that, certainly from one to five. I think you, like, as Shelley said, you have to be deliberate about it because we know that diversity in clinical trial leadership is associated with uh, increased enrollment of diverse trial populations. And then that leads to more applicability and generalizability of results and better outcomes. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's incumbent upon us to overcome the sort of systemic sexism that is, you know, deeply embedded in all aspects of academic medicine and otherwise, obviously not going to get political on this uh, conversation tonight, but um, I'm also very, very optimistic about it because I see change. You know, Alana and I were on a call um, where we're national PIs of another trial just today. And we were thinking about, you know, um, the sponsors were telling us, hey, listen, we only have uh, less than 30% women once again. And how do you think we can improve this? And okay, of course, sorry. <laughs> um, how do you think we can improve this? And we were talking about, okay, let's try, let's talk about incentivizing for it. Is that something that we could even do? You know, and, and incentivizing isn't like, oh, let's pay cash to people who are, enrolling women, but it's recognizing those PIs that are making that active effort. Uh, there can be a variety of ways in which you do that, whether it's a blast email so that they get more visibility, whether they get invited to be a part of authorship groups and sub-analyses of clinical trials and sub-studies. Um, there are ways to, to incentivize people so that it is more overt, like Shelly was saying, and more deliberate that they will engage and they will enroll accordingly. And even if it sounds prescriptive initially, so be it. 
because the end results are positive for everyone. That's right. I think even just stating that this is the goal, right? We are all very goal-oriented people. And so if you start a trial by saying, we want 50% women, we want 40% underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, if every site PI kind of understands that is our goal in terms of recruitment, and then you show your site numbers and you're completely off goal, I, I do think that we're the kind of people who, like, we, we never want to look bad amongst our peers. We're just, we're too type A for things like that. So even making diversity a stated goal for these trials, it seems like simple low-hanging fruit, but I think it makes a difference in terms of incentivizing and other things. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful insights. Um, I have a, a question from uh, John here on the chat. Um, he's asking for the panel, what is it like to act as an ad board member, national lead, or a steering committee member on trials? And as a female cardiologist, sometimes the only women the only woman in that committee, what are some challenges and examples of standing up for yourself as an advocate? Well, you have no experience with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's intimidating. I mean, it, 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 it can be it, extremely intimidating. And I mean, I think we probably all suffer from imposter syndrome a little bit, um, particularly in the beginnings of our careers. Um, if you don't, I don't know what's wrong with you because I certainly, um, you know, got like I needed propranolol every time I would get on stage for the first, you know, couple of years. Um, and then at a certain point, I think you just get over it. Um, I mean, for me, especially, there's so many times where I think I'm the thing, the person that keeps a panel from being a manual because I do some translational research and omics and all these things that are, um, you know, hardcore science or whatever. And um, it, it can be intimidating uh, for sure. But I think, um, you know, one of the things I was sort of taught early on is that you, you're asked to be there, right? Because people want to hear what you have to say. You clearly have expertise in something. Um, and as long as you know that and are not afraid to speak up, um, you know, your, your contribution is valuable. And I think particularly as it pertains to issues like this, right? This conversation related to diversity and prioritizing certain groups, unfortunately, is a, is a conversation that came fairly late, in my opinion, right? We should have been having this conversation the whole time. Um, and there are people, you know, who have, who have been pushing this, but I, mean, I certainly can tell you that I've been asked numerous times in my career, why are you so interested in disparities? You know what I mean? Like, because it, it's important. Um, so I think you also just have to have a commitment and a passion to it, even if the people around you on that panel don't, right, then you become the advocate and you become the person that's, that's pushing to make this a priority. And I think if they see your passion, they will prioritize it to you. You go next, because I've got some thumping going on back here. Okay. I've got a thumping of kids coming up to go to bed, so hopefully they won't be too loud. But um, I was going to say the same thing. I think one of the questions that was going to come forth um, for a spoiler alert, it's like, what is one of the most difficult things that you, you know, have encountered as an academic cardiologist or a clinical trialist? And it was exactly what Alana said. I think it was this, this notion of imposter syndrome. And I think depending on the phase of life that you're in, you go through different types of imposter syndrome. I still have imposter syndrome, but it's different than what it was five years ago. And that was different from what it was five years before that. And you realize that this whole journey is just a process of getting to know yourself better, having faith in yourself, trusting yourself, and being more comfortable in your own shoes. So not to get too spiritual um, about this whole thing, but that's what it really is. It's about being comfortable and proud of who you are, because we are here for a reason, right? You made it this far for a reason. Um, and so don't ever doubt that. And uh, and maybe you guys can all call me up when I doubt it next time too. But that's what these networks and that's what these groups and these conversations are about, right? It's about creating that community and reminding each other when we're feeling kind of down and out that you got this, like we've got this. Um, you have all it takes to do uh, the right thing, say the right things, add something incremental and uh, interesting and um, provocative at different points. And yeah, there'll be times where you don't sound as eloquent as you would have liked. And yeah, there'll be times where you feel like, gosh, I don't really have anything to say. And I'm going next and everyone's spoken and I'm up here on the stage. And what am I doing here? And I wish I was home. Who's taking care of my kids? And you're thinking like all these thoughts going through your head. And that's okay too, because then there'll be other times 
is where you're up on stage and you're rocking it, right? You're just like, wow, I got these questions going on. I know what I'm talking about today, you know? And you just have to recognize that it comes and in, in ebbs and flows and, and be forgiving and I think kind to yourself. You tell no lies. That's well, well said, right? And I think imposter syndrome evolves over time. It's just about sort of pushing yourself. What can I do next? What's the next opportunity for me? But I, I can tell you, I've like some of the people I've sat by in the last few years or so, you're kind of sitting there, your heart rate is up. I won't be like, I would lie to you if I didn't say there are times when I'm like, um, yeah, I'm like, virtually sitting next to Eugene Bronwald right now. And he knows my name. How did this ever happen to me? Right. When I think about it, like he was visiting professor, like everybody's had him as a visiting professor. It's just, it's, um, but speaking out in, um, as a national leader or advisory boards, um, it can be intimidating. Often I'm, you know, one of two women in the room. Um, you know, it's like, me and the Carolyn Lamb show, um, right? It's like the two of us just meeting to meeting to meeting. Um, but um, you're there because you give an honest, truthful opinion. Um, I think it's important to be uh, clinically valid as well. There are a lot of people sitting around these very important tables who don't really see patients anymore either. So I think that that's an important perspective to bring. Um, it's a diverse uh, opinion that I often have, different Canadian perspective as well. Um, but you 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 have to be able to stand up for yourself. And I think um, as I've gone up the academic ranks, I'm more likely to do that now. I think on a national level, um, I wasn't as bold as I am until um, I became associate professor. And I said, okay, my trajectory is on the way now. Um, and I, I'm going to go for professor someday, but it, just that higher academic rank than, frankly, most men in medicine, um, it gives you just this sort of something little extra, I have to say, um, to justify being at those platforms. Um, so, um, and Anu, yeah, so, uh, and I'm, I'm probably, I'm a bit of a disruptor, as are a few of you on this call. Um, so I'm and now, especially now that I'm professor, there's no stopping me. Um, I, I feel like I'm untouchable. I've, you know, I've had the experience, the wealth of experience, um, and I'm pretty forthcoming in a lot of these meetings. John recalls one as well, I think, where we redesigned the uh, protocol for paraglide as a result. I was pretty vocal at that meeting with some very important and powerful men, but it was the, I think the lady voice was very strong at that one. Um, John's nodding his head, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I was extremely happy for it. Um, and I always wonder if somebody afterwards says, wow, she was a firecracker in that meeting. Would they have said that about any of the men if they had said the same thing? And, um, so, you know, I, I your honest approach, you, you just, you brought your opinion and it was very valuable and it made an impact on the protocol and, you know, so, but yes, in a room full of of big names, a lot of big names, right? Mm -hmm. so. And, and the, from the industry side too, big names too. So, um, yeah. Can I just share one, this is a little bit off, you know, maybe topic, but Shelly, I like, I love that because that you just showed everybody what a boss you are and it inspires us to say that too, right? I'm inspired right now hearing this. And you know, one thing that really touched me the other day is you were so kind enough to ask me to speak on behalf of HFSA on, um, uh, COVID related cardiovascular injury at uh, the heart failure, uh, Canadian Congress meeting. And I was attending virtually and Shelly had to introduce me and she is in this huge room. Um, and the camera sort of focused on her and she literally just, you know, said she was unstoppable. She was everything that she just said she is. And she was like, hi, it's great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Everybody you're going to love hearing from her. And it was just the most empowering personal introduction. And I, I said to myself, I was like, why don't I do this more often? This is so wonderful because it makes you feel so welcome. And it makes you feel like someone's on your side, even though you're up there giving a talk. And uh, I think that's it's such a key, important message for us to take home today is 
it's all about the community that we create and about empowering one another and really recognizing rec that there's room for everybody. There are so many opportunities. It's ridiculous. So don't be afraid being like, oh, this person got this. When am I going to get this? I, that happens to me too. So that's natural. But just recognize that there are more opportunities than there are people who are ready to step up. Gosh, this is really inspiring. I'm so glad this is recorded, Emmett. If I'm down and start playing Eye of the Tiger, I'm just going to play this. I'll be motivated. <laughs> um, so I think we have a question from Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh my gosh. Um, this has been so great. Um, Emma, thank you so much for letting me crash the party. Um, so let's see, question. Um, I think when you think about clinical trials and different infrastructures, I think they're totally different across all healthcare systems, um, especially, you know, like someone coming from me, coming from the DCRI, I think, you know, people often describe the DCRI as, as a candy land, right? I mean, for clinical trials, you have pretty much everything. So if, if you want to start getting involved in, a, in clinical trials in a place that maybe has less resources, less infrastructure, um, what would be your advice to start getting involved? Um, how do you go about that as a fellow, as someone who's transitioning um, as early career, and maybe a two-part question would be, if you could go back in time and you could better equip yourselves to be living the life that you have now, which is more immersed in the clinical trials, what would you have wished that you would have done differently in terms of maybe equipping yourself with different skill set or knowledge um, to prepare yourself for um, leading clinical trials, being a PI, if, if that's the route that you want to uh, undertake in, in clinical medicine, in academic medicine. I can, I can start with that. I think Shelly made a point earlier that's so important, right? Which is that as trainees, we get scared away from industry. And it's like, don't talk to anybody in industry. And then after you're, you know, a couple of years out of, out of fellowship or whatever, and you're no longer scared, you realize that there's an incredible amount of resources that you can learn and get from your industry partners. So I wish I had not been afraid to talk to people in industry. Um, and I think to that point, Vanessa, you know, if you're at an institution where you may not have as many resources, working with industry partners to help you sort of figure out what are the resources that you need and how they might be able to provide those resources for you, even if it's for a temporary period of time, because ultimately it's going to help with recruitment or it's going to help with study, you know, engagement, whatever that is. Um, I, like many of you, when I finished fellowship, I started, I was starting a bad program at the VA um, at, in Atlanta. And so I got so many resources and just knowledge from industry partners at that time to help me set up that program. Not to say that my, you know, my academic colleagues weren't helpful, but the industry colleagues were extremely, extremely helpful. And I think for trials, whether it's that your site's not doing as well as you need and it's, you know, is there money for a coordinator or, you know, anything that you just ask, right? The, the worst they can do is say no. But I think that they can also provide you with an extreme amount of knowledge and resources. Um, I already forgot the second part of your question, but I had a good answer to it. Um, but I've already forgotten what it was. <laughs> in time, is there anything that you think you would have done differently to better it? Oh. Yes. So I think the thing that I wish um, I would have known more about is how to manage people. So, you know, when you're in training, you're, you know, mainly focused on managing yourself and managing your patients. And then you become, you know, someone who's involved in clinical trials and you're maybe managing a team of coordinators and you're trying to manage a, a cohort of patients. And it's a skill set that we're not really taught anywhere, but it's, um, it's hard. And I think particularly during the pandemic, the way that um, medicine has changed in terms of more telemedicine, maybe now your coordinators or different people are working from home or they want to work from home. You know, there's so much turnover within the healthcare system, just trying to keep track of all of those people and all of those tasks, in addition to your clinical work, in addition to trying to finish papers, in addition to like having the audacity to want to talk to your children sometimes. I mean, there's just all of these things that you have to manage and it can be challenging. And ultimately, you know, you want to to reach a certain bar, right? Whether that's recruitment, whether that's publications. Um, and so having yourself surrounded by a team of people who 
have that same mindset and sort of keeping them motivated, I think is one thing that I wish I would have known a little bit more about. Yeah, there's a lot of rules in, in hospitals and research networks, and it depends on how well funded you are. So, um, for instance, at my institution, research coordinators don't grow on trees. DCRI, you turn a corner, you run into a research coordinator, right? DCRI is a beast. Like, it's amazing. Um, and, but it's very different for all, most of us out there in that, um, you have to pay the salary of your research coordinator in many institutions. So therefore, you get paid per patient for trial enrollment for industry-funded trials. And you need to be able to pay a nursing salary, which, as Alana points out, we know nothing about human resources either. Um, and so, you know, in Canada, a research nurse salary is, with benefits is no less than $120,000. Um, so you have to cover that plus the research assistant, plus the administrative costs in a lot of these centers as well. So it's really important to find yourself a good mentor who's going to teach you to be a good PI. Like Lalo is a co-investigator. Learn what a CRF is. Learn how to deal with um, adverse events um, and the complexities of the your coordinator's um, scheduling times. Um, and all these logistics, like sending off blood samples by FedEx and the long weekend comes. I mean, there's so many elements to it. Your research coordinator will teach you so much. You need training in human resources to make sure that they're protected and you're protected as well. Um, I think I, I, I did have that opportunity to have a mentor who taught me a lot of that. Um, but a lot of it um, is a bit by, uh, you know, uh, just you know, you live and learn a lot of so some of these lessons and some of them are harder because they have to do with human resources as well. Yeah, I would say I just add to that. I, I mean, like echo everything that has already been said. I, I would say learn to partner with your coordinator in a way that makes them feel excited about the trial. Because, you know, it's, it's honestly, the coordinator job can be pretty dehumanizing. It's oftentimes people who are trying to get into medical school or like need some job in between and they don't necessarily care that much. Um, I, I, mean, I don't mean to generalize, but that, that may be one of the impetus, you know, to, for them to get involved. And so you don't, I, I think it's fun. And um, a part of the process of managing people is, is teaching a little bit, like engaging your coordinators as if they were almost your students in some ways, if they're so interested. And at least I have been lucky to have that teaching them, telling them the premise of the trial, why the trial will make a difference, like making them feel like what they're doing matters because it does matter. And when you partner with them in that way, um, I, I think the energy goes up for everybody. And then you end up being more successful in recruitment because that's their sole job. And what's amazing is once you're successful in recruitment, it's like a snowball effect in a positive way, right? Then they're like, oh my God, we got this shout out that you know, the, the, the company or the, the sponsor sent me, you know, a card saying, thank you so much for enrolling this person. And then they feel like, oh my God, what I do matters. And then all of a sudden they're asked to speak at the next meeting saying like, oh, so-and-so from Mount Sinai just enrolled two patients. Hey, um, Catherine, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you did that? And I'll always turn it over to them so that they feel like they have a voice that we're in alignment and it just makes, every, I mean, anytime you get along with people you work with, life is just more fun that way. I, as I shared with you before, part of the reason I love clinical trial work so much is I love, love working with people. I love connecting with people. I feed off of other people's energy. Um, so that's one thing I would, I would say as a piece of advice early on. I, I started out um, as a PI at NYU for the Commander HF trial, which is rivaroxaban and low EF. And I didn't really necessarily care that much about the actual premise of the trial, but I was like, oh, I'm going to be attending, I'm going to do this. And I befriended one coordinator and we went after it and we ended up enrolling more patients, you know, than anyone did in New York. And I remember Mandeep Mara called me, who was my mentor, who had trained me, who I still was like, yes, sir, you know, hello, Dr. Mara. He was like, hey, Anu, can you talk to me a little bit about how you've been recruiting patients? And I thought he was like pranking me, you know, I was like, what? I'm, just, I'm like, did I do something wrong? <laughs> Are you making fun of me right now? But it was, he was genuinely interested. So um, 
I would say build that partnership early on with your coordinators. Definitely all of the things that you already heard, um, but get them motivated so that you have a team. And that's how it evolved. It evolved from that one person that I worked with several years ago to now having a team of coordinators who, knock on wood, feel excited about coming to work with because I hopefully let them know why what they do matters. Thanks so much for your perspectives on, on this question thing. That's, that's been um, very helpful. I'm um, sorry, I just lost my voice there for a minute. Um, I think we'll have time for two more questions. I'll go on with the, the next questions, you know, going off from, you know, partnership and mentorship. Um, um, one of the questions that we have is now that we are moving to July 1st and we'll have new, you know, possible mentees, coming along our way and you want to create a, a very inclusive and, and genuine environment and recruit uh, as much possible mentees, how do we make sure that we convey to them that we want them to be a part of our team, not because of their gender or because of the color of their skin, but because they truly will be great members of our team and could contribute uh, and improve um, research and improve patient care? And when members of the team in terms of trainees or patients or both, I, I guess both. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, I don't know. I, I think we probably just treat people like people, right? I mean, I know that that sounds silly to say, but, um, I don't want anyone to think that they're sort of not, not valuable because they're not a sort of the desired priority group or something like that. I mean, I think maybe one of the concepts is, um, certainly for trainees, right? Everybody should feel like they're a valuable member of the team, you know, sort of regardless of sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, gender, whatever, like, right, we're all here and we're all trying to accomplish the things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, but then I think, you know, especially with my trainees, I think for, for me, at least I kind of wrap it into sort of looking at the holes in our data and looking at the populations where we still have so many unanswered questions, right? So there are certain populations where you're you know, our outcomes are getting better, but there are other populations where outcomes are getting worse or just haven't changed and trying to sort of wrap the priorities around the data. I think that also works for patients. Um, I think when we, you know, when I sort of talk to certain patient groups, women underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, and I say, hey, you know, we don't understand why this medication maybe doesn't work as well in you because you're a woman, like they're interested in that. It's obviously going to be hard for me to say that to a male patient. Um, but maybe I have a different spiel for a male patient, or maybe I'm talking to a male patient who's an ally and he's like, I really want to understand this too. Um, so I think a lot of times for me, whether it's patients or trainees, um, I get them involved in sort of understanding the why and understanding who it is we're trying to help um, and where the unanswered questions are. And I think that people are really motivated by that. I think it's important still to remember, yeah, it's still about you talking to the patient, um, get their life story. I mean, the, the new residents, they all have life stories, right? They're adults with lives. So they could be parents, they could be pet parents, they could be married. Um, and, you know, it's important to treat them respect respectfully as adults, in, right? In medicine, we tend to always consider the residents as children, right? We, 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 we don't give residents, I think, often the respect that they deserve. And I hope that, you know, over time, the culture of medicine is evolving um, in that way. Um, and when it comes to what you do, that you can have a wonderful patient encounter, just, you know, asking them about where they live and just seeing that real life perspective it's not just you're going to see a copd exacerbation right or mm -hmm. heart failure exacerbation learn a little bit about them it's still the personal touch and connection i think in medicine means so much and really can inspire everybody yeah amen i think uh, like uh, i just want to say <laughs> if i could do that but really i mean it's like uh i think as in as is the case in any, anything in life, it's about that connection. It's about feeling like your, um, that your individual personal story matters, right? Um, and so I think whether you're recruiting a trainee to work with you um, or whether you're recruiting a patient to enter a trial, 
it, it's all about the personal touch, you know? So from a patient perspective, I always, I always ask, what is it that you derive joy from? Um, and how would you sort of describe your quality of life? And what's the one thing I ask I, this question? I always say, if I'm a genie, um, Ashish will tell you this because he's so sick of me saying this, but if I were a genie and I showed up right now, what's the one symptom you'd want me to get rid of? And like, so I kind of try and go in there and, and like find some of those answers that are buried in the nooks and crannies. And then accordingly, I'm able to offer or not offer a clinical trial to a patient. Honestly, if they're like, hey, I'm awesome. My quality of life is 10 out of 10. There's nothing I want you to fix. I don't want anything else. Like, I don't want to push a clinical trial on a patient like that, you know? Uh, even if they meet eligibility and inclusion criteria, that's not someone I, that's necessarily going to derive that benefit. Um, uh, so that's one thing I do from the patient perspective. And then from the trainee perspective, it's all about, you know, breaking away from the mundane stuff that you need to do as a resident or even to, as a fellow, you know, it's what gets you ticking, what actually gets you excited. You know, we call it the shower test. Like, what are the things you think about, like when you're at the end of the day or in the shower? Is it is there like a question that you wonder about or is there something that you, is there a patient that you didn't know how to manage that you wish you knew how to manage better that's not really in the literature? So those are the kinds of questions you want to to try and bring out. You want to bring out curiosity because curiosity is like a very, I think, positive and infectious energy. And once you've established that connection with a trainee from that perspective, I think they're going to naturally want to, to work with you and you're going to want to work with them. It's symbiotic. It's bi-directional always. Thank you. Thanks so much for your answers. I think we have like five minutes left. If anyone in the group has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Don't be shy. Okay. Anybody feeling imposter syndrome? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> no, I'm feeling inspired. Thank you so much for all of your time. Yes. We are so thankful for uh, this opportunity to speak with all three of you. This is such an uplifting um, um, session for all of us. I think I speak on behalf of everyone um, when we uh, say that we are so thankful to have you three here as amazing role models in front of us. So, so thank you so much for your time. I guess I'll just end now with the last five minutes with like closing remarks or Amit, if you have anything else to add, I guess I'll just ask Dr. Morris and Dr. Zirath and Dr. Lala to, to end the night with any of their closing remarks for the cardio nerds. I mean, I, I guess, uh, well, number one, thank you for having me because um, this has been exciting. It's been exciting to get to talk to everybody and, and get to have sort of an, an honest conversation. I think, um, you know, for you guys, especially like the world is your oyster. And there's so, I mean, that's the thing I think that drew many of us to cardiology is like, there's so many different paths. There's so many different things that you can do. Um, and it's, I mean, it's fun, right? You have to kind of create the job that you want in some ways, but you, you know, in order to do that, you've got to figure out what you're interested in. As Ani said, like, what are you thinking about in the shower? What are you passionate about? Um, and try to steer yourself towards a career that looks like that. Part of that is just being honest with yourself, but part of it is also making sure that you, you know, sort of steer yourself in a direction that looks like where you want to be. So thanks guys. It's been an absolute honor to be here. Um, and I would just say if you're interested in a, you know, a career or research being an element of your career, there's so many different ways to do it. I mean, some of our top enrollers in clinical trials are actually uh, non-academic community cardiologists, in all honesty. Um, so there's opportunities to explore research in almost any path you take. Um, so I hope you all um, embrace your inner curiosity, as Anu puts it. And, um, and how, how did the thumb end up on my thing? Can you move thumbs now? It looks great, though. I know I didn't I didn't touch anything so I'm just oh well maybe I said something right there's visual cues on there yeah there's visual cues on zoom now so or uh, um audible cues I forgot about that um but honestly and so proud of of how this group 
really turned around the paraglide enrollment. You were pivotal um, in that clinical trial. So thank you very much from the steering committee and all the national leads and, and the patients as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, you know, uh, last but not least, I, I couldn't agree more. I think being a part of this paraglides, um, this clinical trial network has been so fun for me too, and it continues to be fun and hopefully we can surpass Melvin and Kavita with, uh, <laughs> with enrolling more people. Not that I'm competitive or anything. Um, but it really allows you to, again, form a relationship with a mentee that I wouldn't have otherwise connected with, honestly. And I've worked with Jason Feynman for this program, and it's just so fun. I know, you know, uh, when he got married and where he went on his honeymoon and we exchanged trips, you know, trip stuff, and it becomes a personal connection. So if I haven't already beat that concept down, um, I hope that's one thing that you will take away from this is that recognize that, you know, the world is smaller now in a, in a good way. And, some, you know, in terms of us being able to connect um, and work with one another, uh, despite geographic and institutional borders. So be involved in research um, to answer questions and to work with one another, to, to be a part of this community, um, because it's, it's a constant, um, I think, uh, reward to, to, to get to know those people who are both maybe senior to you and then junior to you. Um, I think it's just really fulfilling and it's inspiring no matter what stage you're at. You know, if I could just add something, um, a lot of people have been asking why or how the Paraglide project has been working. And I think there are so many reasons why that's true and it's so many unknowns that we have to study. But uh, hands down, I think that really one of the most special parts about it is, is the group of PIs because you know, for everyone, Dr. Lala, Dr. Zira, Dr. Morris, you guys are so busy with so many commitments, but for you to donate an hour of your time on a Tuesday evening to a bunch of nerds just to make the world a better place and inspire us. I mean, it's, uh, it's really, it's like, it really is a gift for all of us. So thank you uh, for taking the time. And uh, thanks uh, a lot. Thanks to Leanne for uh, coordinating this and leading this. I know that, uh, you know, it took a lot of time to kind of think about how to make the most of this time. So thank you to everybody.